Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Very rare do you have families any longer sitting together at the table having dinner. I mean, that's like something that is of the past, honestly. Today we live in a society, I mean, just walk around uh, the mall when, when there's the food court or walk into a restaurant and when people walk in, most people nowadays walk in alone and when they walk in, and I know because I do this many times, I'll take lunch during my, my work week and I'll walk in a restaurant, I'm looking down and the first thing I do after I order my food and sit at the table is what? You pull out your what? Or you see families and they're actually sitting together, having lunch, having dinner, and they sit down and they do what? That's, that's the culture that we live in today. And so these next three weeks as I talk about table talk, as I, as I talk about the legitimate idea of a table, I, I really believe that we're all going to be challenged from, from the, the, the unbeliever to the baby believer to the very mature believer. And I want to take you through a, a process of, of how God wants us to grow in this table talk. I want you to please be open and, and don't think that, that you've arrived or, or think that I already know that every single one of us, as you sit under my voice and you listen, I believe that God's going to speak at least one thing to you today that's going to inspire you and that's going to motivate you and that hopefully is, is going to confront you in such a way where you start maybe thinking a little bit different about the table. Now, when I sit at a table, I can't help but think about family, right? Like, that's the first thing. I mean, when you just read all the stories about Jesus in the New Gospel, in the Gospels, in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, everywhere that he went with his disciples, he always sat at table. There's, there was a lot of preaching that went on, but I think that Jesus did more touching than he did talking. And I think that's what God wants from us at the table. He wants us to have that touch. Do you guys like that little mini skit just to kind of set it up? You see how people came to the table. They greeted each other. So you immediately start thinking family. You think that at the table, it's a place also of community, right? It's a place where you come and you hang out together. It's a place of unity. It's a place of laughter. It's a place of conflict. You know what I'm saying? Have you ever had conflict at the table? Right? All of a sudden, it's like, you know, it's Thanksgiving, and you're like, uh, you know, pass me the, the, the corn on the cob. And they're like, uh, there's no corn on the cob. This year, we're doing uh, grits or greens or something. And you're like, what the heck? Are you kidding? And there's this conflict that goes on or that nasty potato stuff that you guys call. What do you guys call that sweet potato? I'm like, pass me the mashed potatoes. Oh, no, you're getting sweet potatoes. I, I didn't ask for no sweet potatoes. Yeah, but it's for your health. No, I want potatoes. <laughs> and then there's this conflict that goes on at the table. So there's a lot of things that happen at the table. There's also, listen, the table's a place where you bring exciting news, right? And there's exciting things that happen in our life that we share with people at the table. But it's also a place where you also share bad news. It's a place of crying. It's a place of pain sometimes. It's also sometimes a place where there is argument. Sometimes you're at the table and, and you're not going to agree. But it's also a table where, where we laugh and, and we pray. We say grace over our meal and we thank God for what he's provided for us. And it's a place where, where we do a lot of eating as well, don't we? And the Bible, listen, the Bible has a lot to say about the table. Let's start with the first one. When you look at the Old Testament, you see this, this Jewish context of a table that they call the Shubra table. The Shubra table was a table that was, it was a dedicated table. Say dedicated. See, because listen, there has to be a dedicated table that you sit at. And it was a dedicated table where they would literally place um, bread and uh, and cakes and loaves of cakes and loaves of, of bread and it was a dedicated specific table that was placed in a specific place that would be given to God as an offering 
And it was something special. Like today, when you came to church, do you realize that you came to give your best offering today? And that was your worship. Today, you gave your very best. You, you lifted hands. You, you sang songs. You hopefully clapped at least once today. Maybe you, you gave a shout. Do you realize that that was your showbread today? That was you being at the dedicated table, ready to worship God. And so there's that table. But then there's that other table. You know, there's the table of David. You know, David, if you read the book of Psalms, David was always having either internal struggle or external war. Constantly. Just read the book of Psalms. This guy was like this emotional roller coaster guy. And, and mind you, he had some real trouble. I mean, everybody wanted to kill David. David was always at war. He was always in battle. He was always having some internal challenge on the inside of him. Do you feel like maybe right now you're going through something internally that you have not been able to overcome? Maybe an idea, a thought, maybe a rage and anger, maybe some res resentment or bitterness, and there's just been this internal battle. Maybe right now there are some enemies in your land right now. Maybe there are some people in your work that are trying to, to destroy you, trying to get rid of you, trying to harm you. Have you ever been in a season where you've had people that will betray you and, 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 and stab you in the back? I mean, I always tell my friends this, like, I'd rather you stab me in the front than stab me in the back. At least I saw you coming. You know what I'm saying? It's when they come from behind you. It's the, it's the hard one, right? But I think that every single one of us can relate to David. And so David reads in Psalm 23, verse 5, you can see, you can begin to read his life, his situation. It says, you prepare a table. Ever say table. <laughs> Look at this. This is, this is another form of table. I got so many table scriptures, but I'm not going to go through them. He says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my what? Dang. Dang. God prepares a table. He prepared. Do you realize that when you walked into this church today, we were prepared for you? We prepared great worship. We prepared a great move of God. You know why? Because we prepared ourselves first before you ever got here. Do you know when our team started preparing? Since Tuesday. We've been preparing for you to come Sunday. Last Tuesday. There's goes so much preparation happens here just to receive every single one of you every single week. Your children, we prepared for them to come. And so think about this. Get the revelation, please. David is saying to God, I finally got the revelation that you prepared the best feast in the worst circumstance. You prepared the best of the best of the best feast in the worst season of my life. And when you begin to think like that, no matter what you face, and let me tell you something, uh, my family and I, we've hit some very difficult, I mean, if you've ever been on a plane and, and, and there's been like some turbulence, man, I'll tell you, there's been seasons where we had some serious turbulence. But there's something about when you finally get a God revelation of his word that he will prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And not only does he prepare a table for you before the presence of your enemies, but he says this, he says, and I'll anoint your head with oil and your cup's going to run over. What does all that mean? What does that even, what does that mean? What does that mean, Pastor? Well, how many here like Roos Chris? Roos Chris, right? Any steak, any steak lovers? Or uh, what, what about Fogo de Chao? Fogo de Chao, huh? You know, just think about the most, the most fine dining restaurant. And you hear music like this. Watch, they're going to play some music right now. You walk into the restaurant. And you got that very nice music. And you, you walk in, of course. And you got to dress good, too, when you go there, right? You go there. So here's the image. I'm Jesus. David. I'm David now. Oh, thank, thank you, Lord. <laughs> Jesus uh, pushes in the chair. Whew, napkin. While my enemies are right there watching. Uh, the monsieur uh, tonight he wants to try the severe. <laughs> Is it the one the cup of wine? <laughs> and and you just you feel like this child 
That's why God says, come to me as children. And, 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 and listen, think, think about this. You can pause the music now. It's good. Thank you, guys. I'm getting too comfortable now. But think, think about this. If any of you have ever, and we have, we have a lot of veterans in our church. It's amazing how many veterans have, have been coming to Elevate Church who have fought. One of them in particular has been Brian Chen, who's fought like three times in Iraq. Okay? And let me tell you something. I've never been to war, but I've seen enough on television. I've seen enough on YouTube. Uh, I haven't physically been in a situation like that, but I've been paintballing. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and... <laughs> And it hurts. It hurts. I'm trying to compare. Don't hate. I'm just saying it hurts. But I just put myself in that, in that, in that war situation. I could only imagine just because I remember one time when I, I, I went paintballing, and it was like a two-hour paintball game. And, uh, and you get hungry out there because you're running up hills, and you get thirsty, hungry. And I had a Snickers bar. But when I was trying to eat that Snickers bar, let me tell you something. You're like, you're eating this Snickers bar in haste. You're eating it with caution. You're, you're like trying to, you're like aware of like what, you know, where's this, where's this paintball going to come from, right? That, that's what war looks like for people that have fought in Afghanistan. They eat in haste. They're, they're eating in caution. They're, they're always like this. Yeah, have you ever lived watching your back? Have you ever been in a situation? Most of you have not, but some of you have. I grew up in the hood. I grew up in the worst of the worst neighborhoods where you had to watch your back when you walked to school because every single day, students would get shot on broad daylight. So every day, we'd walk like this. Well, let me tell you something. When you are in a battle, when you are at war, you are not at rest. And so what God is saying to David, he says to David, David, you can find rest in me. And then when David finally had the faith to grow up and muster up some spiritual maturity, he realized that he said this statement. Put that verse back up, please. He said the table, he says, you, you prepare. I've realized, I've learned that you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And you anoint my head with oil. And he says this, and my cup just, just runs over over how many know that when you learn to sit and rest at the table of God when you finally realize the value of sitting at God's table no matter what enemy is facing you man God will sit you at a table and the enemy is right there watching you have your meal but God's saying but you won't be disturbed no one's going to bother you. No one's going to move you as a matter of fact I have already paid for the bill as well with my blood that's my God. You should get excited. That was your moment right there to get excited. Say, yes, amen. He paid the price. He paid the price for your sin. He paid the price for your failure. He paid the price for your mistakes. He paid the price for your stupidity, my stupidity, your ignorance. He paid, he paid the price even when you couldn't afford it. Jesus said, but I got you covered. Even when you're, and listen, even when you deserve a slap in the face. Because some of us do sometimes. You deserve a good kick in the face. Right? We act like fools sometimes. Come on, don't. Let's not pretend in church. We've all hurt somebody here. We can't just talk about, oh, woe is me, I've been hurt. No, we've, we've, we've all been hurt and we've all hurt people. No one gets away. But God loves both and he says, you can come sit with me because I'm not your enemy. See, I know that when you sit at God's table, I know there's no disturbance. When you sit at God's table, you can be at a place of peace and rest even though it's not. Even though there's war. Even though the circumstances may have not changed on the outside, guess what happens but you changed on the inside because Jesus will touch you at his table. I don't care about the external situation not changing. I care about, but am I changing? Because if you're changing, eventually the external will catch up to the internal change. Are you getting me today? And so there's that table. Then there's the table that we've all know about, that we've all read in the New Testament. You know, there's the table with Jesus when they're breaking bread. Do you guys remember that table? Right? When, I mean, think about it. Even at that table, 
There was an enemy there. What was his name? Judas, man, he's tearing it up right there eating tacos with them right there on the spot, you know. Jesus talking about how one will betray him. Judas like tearing up that carne asada, right? And the disciples like, who's going who's gonna, to who's gonna betray him? He's like, the, the guy who dips the taco in the salsa. And, and right away, and Judas grabs his taco, dips it in the salsa, and the disciples are like, I wonder who that's going to be. You know why? Because, because Jesus molded them, shaped them to have rest and not to be insecure at the table of the Father. They didn't have to worry about who was going to betray. The one who can heal, the one who will be betrayed, was sitting with them. And his name is Jesus. So we sat, we sit at the table. Do you, do you realize that, that the table is a metaphor for the church? The table is the metaphor for the church. It's the church. Every, do you realize that today by you coming to church, did you, you made a, a, a conscious decision to dedicate the table by having your presence here today. You said, I'm sitting at the Father's table this Sunday. You made God your priority today. You took Matthew 6.33 and you fed on that today. Seek first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness. And then all the things you're believing for, God said, man, I'll bless you. Like today, you chose to come to church before you chose to go to the beach. You put the prior before your activity. You put the priorities in order. You put God first. You sit at his table. What happens at the table? We feed on the table. We rest at the table. We connect at this table. We sometimes have a little bit of disagreement at this table. Because sometimes I say things that don't make people feel good. They feel uncomfortable. I've had people have to serve like, Pastor, why were you staring at me? I wasn't staring at you. Like, why'd you look at me? I wasn't looking at you, man. What's wrong? Like, you hiding something? You know, it's like, I, I, I'm not getting, every week it happens. I'm not, even my daughter's like, why were you looking at me? Right, babe? Sometimes she's like, why were you looking? I wasn't looking at you, Alexis. <laughs> Listen. How do I know that God wants to give us joy at his table? Here's why. Because when he told David that my oil will, will run over you, will run on you. Do you realize that oil represents refreshing? Oil represents rest. And you know that when, when you sit at God's, because you chose to sit at God's table today, do you realize that you're going to overflow with rest? You're going to overflow with comfort. You're going to overflow with peace on Monday, Tuesday, and then Wednesday, you're going to get refreshed again. How about that? I'm going to see you all here on Wednesday night. Look at your neighbor and say, you're coming Wednesday. If they didn't look at you, <laughs> tell me, you must be an enemy of God. I'm just playing. Don't say that to them. Listen, when God prepares the table, there's nothing hurried. If you're like this, always sitting in church, you're not doing that to me. You're doing that to God. Are you almost done, God? Oh, but you won't do that at the theater. You'll be there before for the previews. <laughs> you'll be, you'll be. I we can't be late. Can't be, but you'll walk in here at like at 10 after worship, 20 minutes after. Worship's over. You get in your chair. But you won't miss the previews in the theater. We're dedicated to that table. But you ain't dedicated to this table. I had two people walk out at the 8 a.m. It was so cool. I was like. You know why? Because that was the table of conf confrontation. That was, that's called the table of conviction. Well, God doesn't condemn. God doesn't, he doesn't play guilt trip. God doesn't play shame. God convicts. God confronts. But God loves. Can we keep going? So, I love that. So the table is a metaphor for the church. The church is a table where people come to get fed. Listen, guys, it's the place where people come get fed.
It's a place where we bring people and they get fed. And, and, and here's, here's the reality. John 6, 35, look at this quickly. It says, then Jesus said, he said, I am the bread of I'm the pan bolio. I am the French bread. I am the baguette. I am the bread of life. In other words, he said, I am the carbs to your life. For all you keto, makito, wakito, whatever that thing is called. Let me tell you something, man. You do that, but I'm going to have me some Jesus. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to have me some carbs every single day because he is the bread of life. Are you hearing me? Amen. Go ahead. Go have your bread. If I offended your health, I'm sorry. <laughs> then Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. But look at this. But look, look, look. Please stay with me. But whoever comes to me will never go. Hungry. Whoever comes to me will never go. Hungry. Whoever comes to me will never go what? Hungry. So the only way, the only reason most people are, are unsatisfied with their life is because they're, they're, they're malnourished. The reason that most Christians are unhappy, depressed, oppressed, it's not just because we go through traumatic experiences in life. It's because we stop coming to the table. Or we come to the table, right? Because he says, and whoever believes in me will never be what? Thirsty. So it's not just coming to the table and knowing, having knowledge in your head right that okay Jesus is the bread of life I'm sure that most of us in here probably 99 percent agree with that scripture that he's the bread of life here's the problem too many weekends in every single church in America they sit at the table and they know that he's the bread of life but what makes a true follower what makes a true Christian what makes someone really come to that place of knowing who they are in Christ Jesus is not just knowing that he's the bread of life but it's chewing on that bread and it's digesting that bread come on we gotta we gotta we get, it's like you know when Isaac was little We'd heal him vegetables. Isaac was the trouble child. <laughs> Alexis would sit her on the bed with toys and dolls. That girl wouldn't move for hours. I come back, I can come back three hours later. She's still sitting on the on the bed with the little dolls playing. Isaac, where you at, boy? Isaac, we'd have to go look for that boy. He'd be hiding somewhere in the house. I mean, he'd be there and then gone. I mean, it was like, oh my God, Isaac, help us, Jesus. Like, God, you really tested us. And he was so. You know, with Isaac, we'd give him his food, and there was certain food. He was always picky. Like Alexis got mad when he he used to hate steak. And the day he he started loving steak, Alexis was like, why'd you like? Because she used to just tear up all the meat. But anyways, uh, that's a whole other story. She did. Remember when you used to, she got, she was like, why do you like steak? She literally got to an argument at the table of why he liked steak that day. But that, listen, but if, listen, but, but if the table is a metaphor for the church, then why do we trip as family with each other? Why do we trip? Why do we get all goofy? Why, why do we get all offended over stupid stuff a lot of times? Have you noticed that we argue over stupid things, yes or no? At the end of the day, are we family or not? All right, so let's just clean up our act, all right? So anyways, go back to Isaac. That was a, that was a side note. That was free. <laughs> and so we'd give Isaac food, and, 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 and Isaac would like, and then you know what? He would wait. I mean, we're talking, this is a two-year-old that was already thinking like a 10-year-old. And he would put it in his mouth, mm. and then he'd wait for us to turn around, and then he would go spit it out do something with it. So we, we, got, we knew what he was doing. So if I'm like, all right, Isaac, eat. Boy, you're going to chew that. You're not going to ever open your mouth again then because you're going to chew that. You're going to eat that. You're going to swallow. And he would literally fight and fight and fight, and he would not chew that meal i mean there were this boy would literally hold his breath and turn black literally like no more no more, and pass out and you know we always knew it wouldn't kill him you know what i'm saying but this is isaac i'm not kidding you this was isaac he would turn blue and every and pass out and then come back it was the most hilarious thing he did that to us in, in shopping malls restaurants everywhere it was like okay it's all right people get offered don't worry about it he'll come back he'll be fine <laughs> <laughs> it's true it's true ask Isaac ask Isaac 
It was crazy. Well, anyways, so, so, so we'd give him the food, and, and then he would wait to, to try to spit it out. But, but the truth is this, is that, man, we made a decision like, no, you're not going to leave this table until you swallow that. And here's, what's, what's, what's the point, Mauricio? That too many of you come here, and you have the food in your mouth, but you won't chew. That's why the Bible says, meditate in my word day and night that you may observe to do everything that's written in it. Then and only then you will have good success and you will make your way what? Prosperous. And too many of us, we got a lot of food in our mouth and we ain't chewing anymore. I'm talking to people that have been Christians forever who think they've arrived. And I'm also talking to baby Christians that got all excited and think this was all hype and no one's chewing anymore in the church. We need to get our chew back. Look at two neighbors and say, get your chew back. Okay. Don't be too cute now. So listen, believing in me, when Jesus said believing me, he's saying believing me is digesting me. Believing me is chewing me. Believing me is drinking. And some of us don't want to swallow some of the challenges we're facing because we're too prideful and arrogant to just accept the reality that some of us are in a condition that we're probably denying about. You're denying your change. You're denying that you're the problem. Do you know that the only solution in your life is you? Making a conscious decision to sit with him? You're one seat away from your healing. One seat away from your healing. The table. That makes us followers of Jesus Christ. I'm the bread of life. Come on, he's the food. He's the fuel, guys. Food is the fuel to give us the calories and the energy we need in order to know who God wants us to be, but also what God wants us to do. That's a point up there, guys, media. Put that up there. Help them out. Listen, I I'm telling you this. Jesus, God's word, is our food. When you leave God's table... You should know more and more who you are in Christ. When you leave this church, now whether you chewed and, 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 and digested, that's on you. But every time you come to this table, I know for a fact, I'm not the greatest preacher. But I can tell you this much, but I am, I'm, I'm very good at bringing application. And I know because I work hard at it. Because I, want, I never want a Christian to say, I'm not being fed there. Well, let me, let me bring you some surprise. First of all, it is not the pastor's responsibility to feed you. It is Jesus' responsibility to feed you. And the only way he can feed you is when you sit at his table. That means you open your burning bush called your holy Bible. And you, I should be confirming what you've been reading. I should be speaking and connecting with your heart. And you should be saying, Pastor, I was just thinking about that this week. You know what, as I was, you know, as you, now that you're saying this, you know what, God spoke to me about that table thing. I, maybe I didn't get it the way you metaphorically put it together, but I can't, I see where you're going. God's been challenged. God's been talking to me. God's been telling me I need to get my act together. God's been telling you, come on, stop making excuses. God's been challenging me. God's been saying, stop trying to, you know, go from place to place thinking that I need to change my environment. That No, God, God's. God's speaking to us when we sit at his feet. When we spend time with him, he'll feed us. He said, I'm the bread of life. He didn't say your pastor's the bread of life. He didn't say your leader's the bread of life. He didn't say your mom's the bread of life. He didn't say your dad's the bread of life. He said, I am the bread of life. Don't get it confused. He is the bread of life. He is the life. What do we do? We go find every possible book that's going to bring healing to us. This is why it's going to be a three-week series. We're going, to get, we're going to get heavy with this. Okay, so Psalms 34, 8, quickly. I got to go. Man, running out of time. He says, taste and see that the Lord is what? Good. Man, I've tasted some crap before. 
Listen, before I came to Christ, I would eat all kinds of junk that I would, man, the junk of my life, addictions, lust, huh? Anger. Come on, all of us have prepared our own plates. All of us have prepared our own tables. We have all prepared the most miserable meals of relationships, of wrong connections, of bad investments. And, 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 and let me tell you something. When God says, when David got the revelation, taste and see that the Lord is good, maybe you're here today and you're saying, I'm not a church core. Listen, the only reason I'm here is because someone invited me. Let me just inspire you a little bit, please. Beyond the person who invited you to come to Elevate Church, let me tell you what happened. The bread of life, the bread of life on this table has already been wooing you before your friend ever came to you. The bread of life has already, already been trying to attract you. His aroma, his presence has already been coming to you without you even knowing. And so I want you to know if you're sitting here and you're someone who's been doubting God, I want you to be okay with that. I want you to know that it's okay to be someone who is doubting and questioning. You know why? Because I have learned in my 22 years of walking with Christ that faith and doubt work hand in hand. And I know that the religious want to be strong Christians will be like, I can't believe he just said that. Oh, no, trust me. When I had cancer, I had faith to say, by, I mean, I was like a champion when the doctor came and he says, you got Hodgkin's lymphoma. I was like, man, man, by his stripes, I am healed. I was, I was, a, I was, a, I was David, man. I was, like a, I was like taking down Goliath right there. Man, but then I went weak, sick in that hospital. Then my lung got filled with fluid. Then my right lung collapsed. And then I had to go through one surgery. I felt everything in the surgery. Have you ever seen those, 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 those documentaries where they put you out with anesthesia, but you're awake? That happened to me. I woke up. I had like six or seven doctors jump on my body because when they brought me back out, I was screaming. So the, let me tell you something. There were moments where I was doubting my faith. So Christians, those that have been saved, Forever, don't trip on the doubters. You were once a doubter, and even now in your faith, you have doubted whether or not you were going to come out of a situation. But God is faithful. He is the bread of life. That's why he says, come to my table, because your table, you'll be malnourished. My table, I will fulfill you. I will satisfy you. We're looking for all the wrong relationships in all the wrong places, and God's saying, come to my table. I'm going to satisfy you so much that I will keep you full, and you will never hunger or thirst again. Amen? Amen? So taste and see that the Lord is good. He's good. I know some of you right now, you got some pain hunger. Have you ever had your stomach go off? The growl? You're in a meeting, you're like, I promise you that wasn't a fart. That's my, I'm hungry. <laughs> right? Have you, ever, have you ever done that? Be honest. Man, I've been in meetings, I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, man. That was my, that was my stomach. I'm hungry. I, listen. There's pain hungers in the church. I, I know a lot of Christians in this church. In every church, every place I go, places I preach, places I'm invited. Man, you got a lot of, a lot of Christians that, that pretend they're full. But they're so unhappy and so unsatisfied. And, and, and here's the deal. Come to my table is what Jesus said. And I will never, ever allow you to hunger again. But it hasn't changed. I said I would change you. God, listen, we always get hooked up on everything Jesus said. But we fail to look at what Jesus never said. Jesus said, do not let your heart be troubled. I'll heal you. He didn't talk about anything outside of that. He just said, I will take care of you. I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Are you hearing me today? But please realize this. It takes a special maturity to understand this. 
And I know there's some of you, you're in this place where you have this, this pain of dissatisfaction. You have this pain of, of unfulfillment, this pain of disappointment. And, and these are hunger pains, and they're real. And, and I'm not saying deny your hunger. I'm saying come to the table, wherever you're at. If you're someone here that you're just coming around church, just checking out, you're like, I'm, I'm telling you, God loves you. And, and let me tell you something. And, and sometimes I speak to people that are far away from God, and they'll, they'll tell me things like this. You know what? I'm dirty, man. You don't even know what I did or what I've been doing. You, just picture this. That's like a homeless person saying, hey, you know what? I, I haven't taken a shower for like, you know, six months. I haven't, I haven't, I haven't taken, and their hair's out of whack and everything. And you're telling them, okay, well, go, go wash up before you can come. No. Let them come. I mean, there's order in the house, that's for sure. But let them come. That's what I tell people. I'm like, you don't have to get fixed to sit with God. You don't have to get right because you'll never get right. You'll never get right until you get with God. Never. Until you learn to sit at his table, until you learn to feed on Jesus, you will never get right. You won't get your marriage right. You won't get your walk right. You won't get your speech right. You won't even get your attitude right. You won't even get your heart right until you learn to sit with him. He makes you right. You can't make you right. Have you tried? How's that meal? It ain't working. You're, you're, trying, to, you're trying to do microwave meals. God's trying to give you a fine dining experience. Huh? We want microwave, give it me now. And you're, you want to you wanna dissatisfy. That's why we're so malnourished. We're such a, a, a drive-through church. We're such a drive-through Christian society. We want everything fast, now, ahorita, now. And if it doesn't happen, we're so dissatisfied. God's like, I'm trying to give you an experience with me, something that's going to be sustainable. Have you noticed it's very rare to see Christians last very long anymore? There's always something. Okay, let's get going. You're all too serious. So let's talk about the chairs, and that's it. We're out. Get, bring the piano person up so they feel like we're done. <laughs> I'm giving you dessert now. Hey, so check this out. I'm going to spend time the next three weeks because now we have to identify what chair are you sitting in. So, so chair number one, we'll call it one. Ever say one. Chair one is the seeking person. It's the unbeliever. It's the doubter. It's the one that's searching. It's the one that's just kind of like walking in, just trying to fill it out. But it could also be that Christian that's been going to many churches and still can't find a place. And maybe they've been like that for a long while. And, and they're sitting there and they're still contemplating kind of because they're, they're, they're just new. They've, they've been to church in the past, but there's never been that connection. And, and there's never been that, that place to call home and family. And uh, so that's chair one. Chair number two is the baby believer. It's the, it's the new Christian. It's the fresh faith. It's the one that gets all excited when they first got saved and they just can't wait to tell everybody. For example, when I first got saved, I've cared, of course, I went from atheist to, to radical, like, Apostle Paul experience, man. I had literally a Damascus deliverance, like, major. My salvation was like, it was radical. I would preach Jesus to everybody so much that even I used to spend a lot of time with law enforcement. And, um, and one of my best friends, he was a cop. Uh, his grandmother was a devoted Catholic. And you know what? Growing up, Catholicism was always worshiping saints or mixing uh, white magic with Catholicism. And so I would see shrines and all this. So in my head, I was like, dang, that's wicked. Once I started learning about Christ, I'm like, dang, he, he said worship no other God. You know, but today in our society, we also see that today in, 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 in 2019, we are seeing now Christian churches, not just Christians, Christian churches are 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 mixing new age with the bible today churches i know some of them are mixing new age you know why to be relevant to keep people comfortable oh there's no comfort here no you should be uncomfortable in your chair you should be uncomfortable with god but god should be comfortable with you and so anyways so so i got all radical like man yeah i was 
Number two, man, I'm crazy. And so he told me, he's like, yeah, my, my grandmother's, she's Catholic. And I'm like, dang. I'm like, dude, you know your grandma's not, is going to hell, right? You know? And he's like, he's like, he's like, he's like come again? I'm like, yeah, dude. Hey. I'm like, then Catholics, man, they got, got all these saints, man. They're worshiping all these devils and demons. And, you know, mind you, this is my experience. I grew up in, in seeing witchcraft. So I know what I, I'm telling you from, from experience. I'm like being cute. I'm telling you what I saw Catholics say and do. I saw the, 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 the demonic curses they would place on people through Catholicism with priests in the place. And I'm like, your grandma's going to hell, bro. You better lead her to Jesus. And, man, it was wrong, obviously. I wasn't right. I was wrong. I was a baby believer. That's kind of like this. When Isaac was little, I'm sorry, son, <laughs> using you as an example all day today. But Isaac used to be like little Tarzan. And remember, Alexis, that he would be in his diaper always just, he would always be like just diaper and nothing else. And he would literally be like an ape all over the house and he would run and jump like he'd be on the table and and and, and then he would jump off the table onto the kitchen countertops and be like Isaac and we'd, we'd have to go catch him literally I would have to catch him sometimes because he's about to go into a glass uh, a glass uh, uh, table and and I'd have to midair catch that boy I mean he was just but wild you know, and, and I'll never, there was times where, man, we'd be sitting at the table, and, and all of a sudden, Isaac is not sitting. He's standing there with no diaper, doing his, oh, ah, like, boy, get your, boy, go put on your diaper. What are you doing? What am I saying? That many times that some of us that claim to be so mature, we start hating on the ones that are baby believers. You can't expect a baby to be the parent. We're all in our process for those that are on table two. But which one do you identify with? Chair number three. Sorry, table. Chair two, not table. Chair three. That's the mature believer. And let me just be very clear. I don't care how many years you've been saved. Because I know people have been saved for 25 years and are the most immature people. Like always offended. Something bothered them. God forbid you, you know, you walk by them with accidentally forgetting to say hi. <laughs> Ain't looking at anybody. <laughs> but they're mature. They see things from a God perspective. They have an attitude that no longer, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Chair number three is the person that finally understands that that God has a plan no matter what the circumstance may be. Chair number three is the person that understands that their full focus and attention should be for chair number one. Chair number three is a person who is active in reaching people. Chair number three doesn't talk the same like everybody else. Chair number three walks differently, worships differently praises differently chair number three believes differently than chair two and chair one chair number three walks with authority walks with power chair number three declares that no matter who would stop worshiping they'll never stop worshiping their living god chair number three expands the church for god chair number three builds the house of god Chair number three serves the house of God. Chair number three loves to be generous. Chair number three is looking for opportunities. To sh Chair number three walks into coffee shops no longer just drinking a cup of coffee, but looking for people and asking themselves, I wonder if they're going to hell. This week I was at a store and I happened to see someone from our church there and, and we all started talking and talking like fashion, whatever, because they're very fashionable people, amazing people. And, um, and we're sharing. And then we get in the line, and we're like, ah, what the heck, let's share the same uh, register person, you know. And so we get to the register. I'm like, you guys go first. And they're, so while we're all, like, chip-chatting away, we start talking to the register lady, and we're like, hey, so, you know, what's up? And we're having this conversation. Why? Because that's what chair three people do. So how's your day going? What are you doing? What's, what's going on? And how's your life? And so we started 
cracking up jokes between the register lady and us. And, and I just said, hey, lady, uh, I didn't say lady, but hey, ma'am, do you, do you go, oh, her name was Ruth. I'm like, hey, Ruth, because I read her name there. I'm like, hey, Ruth, um, do you go to church? And she was surprised that we asked her that. And she's like, I actually do. She couldn't remember the church name, but she did eventually. <laughs> it was funny. <laughs> one of the people that was with us had to tell her, oh, do you go to this? Oh, that's the one. That's the one. Anyways, yeah, it was funny. But what's the, what's the point? The point is this, is that chair number three is always looking for an opportunity to connect with someone. Long story short, you know the story when Jesus is inviting everyone to the great banquet. Remember the great banquet? It's found in Luke 14. Read it. That's homework. He says, he sits at the table. You guys can put the first verse of it. Look at this. First verse of Luke 14 says, and when one of these, those at the table with him, uh, where were they with him? At the what? With him, right? They heard this, and he said to Jesus, blesses the one who will eat at the feast of the king. Do you realize that when you die, and hopefully you go to heaven, right? Because if you claim you have Christ, then you're going to heaven, right? If you don't have Christ, you need him today. There's a table, a feast. When you die, you'll be sitting at his table in heaven. That's a whole other sermon. But in this story, as you go home and read, Jesus tells the story of a master who has very close friends, family members, co-workers, people of influence, people that, that he cared about. And this master is, is sending out personal invitations, kind of like our Easter invitation. If there's anyone here, anybody have an Easter invitation? It's kind of like the Easter invitation. Not one Easter invitation on each other. Oh, here we go. Thank you. And so, you know, he says, hey, I'm inviting you, Carlos." you know, to Easter Sunday. And, and so they start, so he has the servant go out and hand the personal invitation to all of his friends. And he says, hey, the banquet is ready. Everything is ready for you. Come, let's party, man. It's on me. We're going to, it's paid for. And, and the story goes on that, that each one started making an excuse. The first guy, you know, he comes to him, like, hey, uh, uh, you got advice? Like, ah, I, I can't go because, you know, and I just bought this plot of land. A real estate agent, right? And well, you know, I gotta, I gotta go. I gotta go look at. It. I gotta go take care of all the, the, the escrow and all that stuff. So uh, I can't do that right now. I was like, okay. The next person, like, hey, yeah, uh, here's the invitation from Pastor Mauricio. He's inviting you to come hang out. Ah, uh, I just bought a brand new ox. That's kind of like you going on Sunday and buying a brand new car. You know, I gotta go for a test drive. So this guy's like, I gotta go test drive the ox. Like, come on, really? Okay. So the next person, like, hey, you got invited. Oh, I just got, I just got married. I can't go. You know, it, I, so, so what happened is the Bible says this in that verse in Luke 14. And all alike had many excuses. What am I saying to you? Chair number three has this compelling, that's point number three, is compelled no matter how many people you've invited in your family who has yet to come, no matter how many friends have told you, yeah, I'll be there, and then last minute they don't show up because the pet goldfish got the flu or whatever. Listen, chair number three never stops. And if you read the story that says that the master said to the servant, then you know what? If they won't come, then I want you to go to the lame, the blind, the poor, the sick, the defeated, the broken, the busted, the disgusted, and you bring all of them. If the ones that I personally invited will come, then you go and you go to the highways, the byways, the country. You go. In other words, what is Jesus saying? He says that chair number three is completely concentrated on chair number one. And while you're doing chair number one of reaching people, you know what you do? You're helping develop chair number two. Why? Because we need to move some people from chair number two to chair number three. But we got, we got too many ones. We have few twos. That's the truth in the body of Christ. I'm not talking about Elevate. Because I think you guys get a very balanced diet here. And we push you. In a good way. But we need more chair number three people here. What seat are you sitting on? Every seat matters. Close your eyes. Father, we thank you for every single person here today. We thank you that you're, you're motivating us. You're, 
You're inspiring us. You're challenging us to grow spiritually, to develop our faith more, to, to be more focused, Father, on what matters to you, and that's souls. You said go into all the world and preach this gospel. Father, I pray that there be a holy conviction in our life to reach people, to love people, to invite people to this table. And we know that our table is Elevate Church. It's the place where we bring people and where the Father meets them. It's where we introduce them to the bread of life. Lord, move us, help us. If you know that you've been in one seat for too long, tell God, God, I'm ready to move to the next seat. Tell him, God, forgive me because you know what? Some of us even could have been at table three one time and went back to table two, I mean chair two. You were at chair three, you're back to chair two. Listen, no condemnation. Go right back. You know you're greater than that. You're bigger than that. Father, strengthen every person here to hunger for you, Jesus, to thirst for you because you'll fulfill us. Get that same attitude. If you're sitting here, you're that person that has never either A, known Christ, or maybe it's been the fake Jesus. What's the fake Jesus? Man, the one that you haven't really been following at all. You just kind of made up in your head that I'm saved because I've, I was born in religion. I, was, I heard about God, and now I think I'm, no, 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 no. Jesus said, invite me into your heart. Revelation 3, he says, I stand at the door of your heart and I knock. He's saying, you open the door and invite me into your life. And today, maybe you're sitting here and you've never invited the real Jesus into your heart, the one, that wants, the, that one, the one who wants to have intimacy with you, the one who wants to know you personally, the one who wants to connect with you, the one who wants to love you, the one who wants to heal you, the one who wants to commune with you, the one who wants to do family life with you. His name is Jesus, the one who paid for your sins, the only one that has paid the price for you in order for you to make it into heaven. Without Jesus, he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Without him, you have no access to God the Father in heaven. You need Jesus. Your eternity depends on it. Don't be the person that says, let me get me right, then I'll, then I'll come to him. No, you cannot get right. He makes you right. When I count to three, here's what I do every single week. I ask people, lift your hand up. Why? Because I want you to respond to God with boldness and courage and say, I want this connection with you, Jesus. And then we all pray together. I don't embarrass anyone here. I don't have to do that. I don't have to try to validate my preaching just to get people to come up. Listen, God sees your hand. God sees your heart. When you lift that hand, God says, man, that's my kid right there. And he saves you. And he rescues you. Ready? At the count of three, you lift your hand up if you're saying, I'm receiving Christ today for the first time. Or maybe I've just been playing church and, man, I'm receiving the real Jesus now. Today is my day. At the count of three, you're going to lift your hand high. Ready? No more excuses. No more making excuses of why not. No, you're going for it. Ready? One, you're not afraid. Two, this is your day. Three, if that's you, lift your hand high quickly. If anyone here, you're saying, I want Christ. I see those hands. See that. Anyone else? Lift it high. I see that. I see that. I see that. Awesome. Perfect. There's no shame. That's awesome. Anyone else in the back? Anyway, you maybe thought, man, I was too nervous. That's so cool. I love seeing hands go up. You can put your hands down. That's cool. Let's all pray this together, church. Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord and be my Savior. Forgive me of all my sins, every one of them. Today, I come to your table of forgiveness, mercy, and grace. I receive you. As the head of my table, the Lord of my life, the King of my life, I'm born again, filled with your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for not giving up on me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Awesome. Give the Lord a big hand clap. And for those of you watching online that have prayed this prayer, just mark them there. That was me today. And every single week, I love when I see people that mark, I received Jesus today for the first time. I love that. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.